I have a younger brother who is a high school teacher in another part of the country. And uh, he gets unusual names that come through his system. But I talked to a couple of teachers after first service who told me the same thing. Gets some pretty unusual names. And I, one of my favorites is uh, he had a kid go through his class named King, K-I-N-G, which I like. That's a pretty cool name. Um, but what's, what's funny about it was a couple years later, his younger brother came through, and he was also named King, but had two eyes. That was the only difference in his name. Um, he, met a, he met a parent at a parent-teacher conference whose name was Moner Leeser. The funniest ones um, came from not his district, but a nearby district, a neighboring district. And some of you have heard of this. There were twins named uh, Lemangelo and Orangelo. You guys heard that? Yeah. Spelled lemon jello and orange jello. Lemangelo and Orangelo. I like unusual names. My kids should bless their mother because they would have had different names. Uh, if I would have been in charge, if I would have won that. I like unusual names. And I think maybe that's why um, I'm kind of drawn to the guy that we're going to study today. His name is Anasaphorus. He's a Bible character that you probably don't know much about, maybe know very little about, because he's only mentioned in, in one book, uh, the Apostle. Probably the reason that we know him is because he's a friend of the Apostle Paul, and he's a good friend uh, of the Apostle Paul. But uh, Anasaphorus is not a Bible hero. You know, we, we, if you have hung around little kids, little boys in church, Sunday school, children's ministry, whatever, they, you know, they want to be uh, Samson, big strong dude, or they want to be David that took down Goliath. People don't talk about being, they're not inspired to be on a Sephora. And my hope is that by the time we're done, you'll want to be like on a Sephora. I do. I do. I've been really enjoying kind of discovering who this guy is at a deeper level in preparation for this message. Now, if you remember, we are beginning a series, in the beginning of a series, started last week with Wes, based on the words of Jesus from Luke 16, 10. If you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. Would you say that with me? Read that with me. If you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. That appeals to me. I want to have a large faith, a larger faith than I do, so that when trials come, my faith rises up and I handle it better than I handle it now. I want to have a large faith so that when God asks me to do something that's difficult or challenging, I'll do it. I'll step up and do it. I just know that I have room to grow for a larger faith. And my hope is that the same thing happens to you, that you will want to have a larger faith. And what we've learned here is the way to do it is start small. If you have faith in smaller things. In fact, I think I've, I'm recognizing that what we have gone through um, as a nation, maybe even as the world over the last couple of years, it's just kind of taken some of the wind out of us, you know? I, I think that, that uh, Christians have taken some steps back. I think churches have taken some steps back. And I don't know if this is the time, I, I like to think it is, that we can start to move forward again. And so it might be that you personally need this to learn how to take some small steps to rebuild your faith, especially if it's been chopped out from under you. Rebuild your faith. Build it back up to be faith, being faithful in large things. That's what my hope is, because that's what we see uh, from uh, Honest of Forest here. And he does have an odd name. It's a strange name, but here's what it means. It's translated. So in his language, his name means advantage bringer. How cool is that? Like if you knew somebody whose name was advantage bringer, every time you say hi to them, you see them, you say, well, hi, advantage bringer. What does that say to you? They're bringing you an advantage. When you think about your friend, the advantage bringer, same thought. I just, I just love the, the positiveness of that. So Anas uh, Sephora is going to be this uh, example for us about bringing an advantage. He is mentioned by, by Paul because that's exactly what he did for Paul. And Paul needed an advantage bringer. In fact, we're going to look at Paul probably in a way that you've not seen him before. 
Because whenever we look at Paul, we see um, th this master theologian who wrote the book of Romans. We see this bold revival preacher who will go into a strange town and boldly preach and start Christian churches, start the church of Jesus, and he will um, expose false religions and false gods. We see Paul who is unafraid to stand up against authorities, fearless. That's, who's, that's who Paul is. That's his reputation. But we're going to see a very different Paul here. We're going to see Paul the prisoner, and it's, it's taken a lot out of him to be a prisoner. We're going to see him as, as Paul, who is under the authority of Rome. We're going to see him as under the authority of Nero, who is the emperor of Rome. Nero is an insane man, and Nero is cruel, and Nero hates Christians. And so you could be arrested for being a Christian, and the result was you would be crucified to kind of mock Jesus. Your body would then be covered in tar. You would be impaled on a pole, stood up in the city, and set on fire to light up the city at night. That's Nero. And that's the world that Paul is in, and that's what he's watching happen. And that's when Paul writes... In 2 Timothy 4, 6, having seen what I just described to you, he says, I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. He is empty, like taking a glass and doing, I'm being poured out like a drink offering. And the time has come for my departure. He knows it's over. Paul's not in a good place. He's not in a good place emotionally. He's not in a good place spiritually. He's not in a good place literally. He is in a place called Mamertine Prison. And Mamertine Prison was the place that you got sentenced if you were um, sentenced to death. Mamertine is where you would spend the rest of your life until you were killed. And that's where Paul is. And it is a horrible, horrendous place. It's a big, big hole in the ground. Just this pit. Prisoners are dropped into the hole. They can't climb out. There's no bathrooms there. It's just a hole in the ground. There's no showers there. So, I mean, without me getting graphic, you understand his circumstances. This, this is a horrible, horrible place that, that Paul finds himself in, and he needs encouragement. He's, he's despairing. Did you hear his despair when, he, when he's talking about, I'm just being poured out like a drink offering. My, I'm, I'm, about to, I'm about to depart. He needs encouragement, and he gets it, when we read in chapter 1, verse 16, it says, May the Lord show mercy to the household of Anasaphorus, there's our boy with a strange name, because he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. Now, Anasaphorus is the advantage bringer who shows up at Mamertine. He's, here's why. Because Anasaphorus knows his role, knows his giftedness. He is the advantage bringer, and he always shows up as the advantage bringer. He always shows up, as Paul says here, as one who refreshes. He always shows up as one who brings cheer. He always shows up. He's, he's not ashamed. Now, listen, for him to go to Mamertine, just think about how difficult that was. Uh, think about all that he risked to go be faithful in that one thing about being an advantage bringer. Because he's, he's going to go to Mamertine Prison, and you know how he's going to visit Paul? He gets a rope put around his chest, under his arms, and lowered down into that hole to hang out with Paul. And when he gets there, he finds a very despairing, discouraged Paul, probably shackled, maybe not, but probably shackled. Talk about disgusting. And what can he do for him? What, could, what can you do for someone in those circumstances? You're about to die. You're living in this hell hole. This is an awful, awful circumstance. How can he help that? Paul says, he refreshed me. Isn't that wild? He refreshed me 
and he was not ashamed of my change. And what I want you to hear is the, the, the meaning, the background behind that word refreshed. It has two meanings, not, not separate meanings. It contains both of them. When you use that word, it contains both of them. The first one is it, it bring, you bring fresh air. And so he's describing someone, the word describes someone who is despairing, someone who is suffering so hard and they don't understand it and it's really bad and they're discouraged and they're hurting and they're perplexed and they're like, why am I here? What should I do with it, this mess? It can't get any worse. And, and they're just, it's like they're suffocating. It's like they can't get oxygen. They're just, there's a, there's a weight on their chest. They can't breathe. And Paul says... Somehow, some way, in those circumstances, Anasiphorus revives them. He gives him fresh air. He refreshes him again. It's like, oh, the weight is off my chest. I can kind of breathe again. I can understand a little bit what's going on in my life now because Anasiphorus, the advantage bringer, has come to him. The second thing that the word means is to bring cheer. Isn't that interesting? Somehow, again, Honest of Forest brings cheer to a man who's in like the worst circumstances that I've ever imagined anybody being in. And uh, somehow, Honest of Forest brings cheer. Paul says, he not only brought me fresh air, he's cheered me up. Paul's under a death sentence for crying out loud. He, he is living in the, literally in a pit. His circumstances are unbearable, and somehow, honest of force, cheers him up. You know what that means? That they are smiling. They are laughing. In those circumstances, somehow, this guy, the advantage bringer, because he used that one small thing, that gift he has, and he takes it to Paul unashamed, with energy, and he cheers him up, and he gives him new life. He breathes again. I, it's kind of strange to even imagine what that would be like. Uh, you know, I hope that you guys will forgive me for, for talking about this so much lately. Um, my brother died a few weeks ago, and uh, I, I was greatly impacted by it. And one of the things that happened, I think, is applicable to this, and I want to share it with you. Um, you know, we, we watched him. He had cancer for actually probably a couple, three years um, but then really the last few months, it was very aggressive, and we watched the cancer just eat away at his body. He lost 100 pounds, and his body was just a skeleton with skin stretched over it. And we watched that. Our family would Zoom uh, once a week or so uh, it, uh, in the evening. And when it came time that we knew that he was uh, not going to be here much longer, we were able to arrange a trip where all four siblings got together. Three of us, my, uh, uh, me, my brother, my sister, went down there to see Dave. And as you can imagine, it was really hard. We, we cried every single day. We were there for a couple, three, four days. We cried hard every single day as he said goodbye to us, and we said goodbye to him, and we were hurting, and it was painful. And sometimes it just felt like you couldn't breathe. It's just so hard to say goodbye to him. But I grew up in a family that had Full joy, full Holy Spirit joy, the gift of the Spirit. My family had joy. All grown up, uh, my, uh, mostly my mom, my dad wasn't that full of joy. My mom, my mom she, he, he was a nice balance to her. Uh, my mom, you know, because dad was working all the time, she, we had so much fun. We laughed all the time. We joked all the time. And, and fun and, and humor was a really high value for my family. Um, not everybody appreciates that, but it was a real high value for my family. And so when the four of us are together, we would cry hard every day, multiple times every day, shaking, convulsing, kind of crying. And in the same day, multiple times, we would shake, convulsing because we're laughing so hard, retelling old stories and, and making some new ones and just a lot of hilarity uh, um, in that time. And I don't know if you can understand that. I don't, I don't know if you can understand that. Like, I'm not kidding. Every five minutes, the things might change from one to the other. That is what Anasiphorus did for Paul. He brought him refreshment, and he brought him cheer in absolutely ugly, dire circumstances. 
one small thing. He was faithful in it. One small thing. And did you see that Paul said he did it often? He did it a lot for, for Paul. Now, I want to take a little bit of a turn here uh, as part of a challenge because how many of you know that um, not everybody is an honest ephorus? Not, not everybody is a, is a soul refresher, are they? Not everybody is a cheer bringer. In fact, cheer is not in their thought process. Their primary thoughts are about fear and despair and all kinds of angst, and they see danger in everything, and they see evil in everything, and they see bad in everybody, and they do just the opposite of being soul refreshers. They're soul sinkers. You, they just, they, when you hang out with a soul sinker, you walk away feeling worse about yourself and probably worse about, about everything else. They're discouraging. They're negative. They're overwhelming. And they want you to be the same way. And they, they, can't, stand, they can't stand that you might be happy. They, they don't understand it because what that means is you don't know as much as they do, so they need to educate you, and they educate you by sinking your soul. So you can feel as miserable as they feel. And you can start sinking somebody else's soul. It's just, it's just ugly. I don't, I don't see that in the gospel anywhere. I don't see that's who we are supposed to be. Rather than bring cheer, they just kind of like suck joy out of a room. Not a lot of smiling. There's just, uh, just ugliness everywhere. Their, their life is horrible. They want your life to be horrible. Let's just not have any joy. Let's just sink. Spirits, spirits don't get lifted. Spirits get sunk. My soul sinkers. You probably have a soul sinker in your world. You might have one at work. You might have one at school. You might have one at home. You might have one in your neighborhood. You probably have a soul sinker or maybe a couple of soul sinkers in your life. And if you do, I'm really hoping that you also have a soul refresher because it's really hard if all you get is the soul sinker message because you'll become one. We need, our world needs soul refreshers. You know how to, how to recognize a soul sinker? You guys remember uh, Debbie Downer? But like the Saturday Night Live, Debbie Downer. You know, somebody talk about some really cool thing, and immediately you'd hear, wah, wah. And then she would tell you something horrible. That's a soul sinker. That's a soul sinker. And you probably have some in your life. Here's how you can recognize a soul sinker. What are their conversations about? Or maybe it's you. What are your conversations about? Is it soul sinker stuff? Is there, is there any joy? Is there anything that lifts the spirit? Is there anything that's encouraging? What's the conversation about? What are most of the social media posts about? Is there anything that, that lifts the spirit or is it sinking? Again, I think uh, soul sinkers are just happy people drive them crazy. Because it doesn't make any sense to be happy. It feels like God has just left us. Let's just try to trudge through and get to heaven. Rather than be the kingdom of God people. Rather than be excited about Jesus Christ and who he is and, and what he's done. By the way, if you're a soul thinker, uh, you can keep your one small thing. We don't need it. <laughs> we, we get enough of it. We, we, we don't need that. So church, here's what I want to ask you. When you discover someone is in your life... Who is, who is really troubled. Someone's going through some hard stuff and it can be a million different things. And I know that you have people in your life right now who are there. They're scared about this. They got this bad news. This doesn't look promising. Uh, maybe it's a family or kids, a neighbor, a friend. You got stuff going on at work. I know that you have people like that in your life and I want to know what you're doing for them. I want to know what you are bringing to them. Are you an advantage bringer? Are you bringing them souls refreshed? Are you bringing them cheer, like Anna Sephora's? Are you lifting them up or are you tearing them down? Are you, are you building them up or are you taking their legs out from under them? 
Who, who are you? What category do you fit in? Listen, I'm going to tell you this. You know, I, I've been in ministry over 40 years, and I have never seen anything close to what's ha- happened to us and having our spirits sunk. We need spirit refreshers. We need soul refreshers. And I, I have to tell you that I, I really believe there's something to this idea of just one small thing, if that's who we become, if that's, who, if that's who half of the people in this church can flip that switch and become soul refreshers, that's one small thing that God will use in mighty, mighty ways. You know how I know that? He did here. He did with, with honest of force. Paul has soul sinkers. He's got them in his life. We read in, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, number, in, in verse 8, it says, don't be ashamed of me. What's he feeling to say that? Don't be ashamed of me. Verse 12, he says, I'm suffering. I, I'm, I'm struggling to breathe. I am suffering down here in this hole. And he says in, in verse 15, you know that every, everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me, including Phagellus and Hermogenes. Those are church leaders. Those are his buddies. Those are his people. And they have abandoned him. He needs soul refreshers. And he's getting soul sinkers from his fellow believers. And, and let me tell you this. I believe with all my heart that Honest of Force could have easily joined those guys. Because you know that this is going through his head. Thinking about Paul in, in Maritime Prison, Maritime Prison, you know that this is going through his head. Here's what I am. I am a soul refresher. I'm an advantage bringer. I'm a cheer bringer. That's what I'm supposed to do, and I've done it for Paul so many times. But going to Maritime, I don't think so. That is way too dangerous. Because if I am discovered as, believing, as being a believer, and why else would I go visit Paul? It could be they drop me in there and don't drop the rope to come back out. Nero's all Christianity is a revolution trying to overthrow the government. You were the enemy. And honestly, Forrest has lots of reasons to say, man, I should not do that. That'd be crazy for me to do that. Because if I get stuck in the prison, I won't be able to do that for anybody else ever again. But that's not faithfulness in one small thing. That's quitting on it. That's, that's stopping on it. And honest force won't do that. He knows what he needs to do for Paul, and he won't abandon him like the other people did. In fact, Paul says in verse 17, on the contrary, when he was in Rome, he searched hard for me until he found me. He searched hard to find me. Rome didn't keep prison records. They could care less if your family found you or knew where you... They they would enjoy you rotting by yourself in a hole like that. And so what that means is that Honest of Forest went from jail to jail, prison to prison, day to day, to find Paul because he was faithful in this small thing about being a cheer bringer, an advantage bringer. He wasn't going to be held back. And Paul, Paul's amazed by it. Honest Force was unashamed to be associated with a convicted felon. He showed great personal courage because this cat is faithful in one small thing. I wonder what might have happened if Honest Force had not been faithful. If Honest Force had not been what Paul needed when Paul needed him most. Here's the deal, man. Paul gets all kinds of credit, properly so, for building the church, starting the church. I mean, Paul was the missionary that went all over Europe. He, he covered the West, and the West moved across the ocean to where we, churches dotted all over the West. A lot of it can be taken, most of it can be taken back to what Paul did. This is an amazing thing that Paul did, a wonderful thing that Paul did. But I wonder what would have happened had he not had Honest of Force as his advantage bringer, cheer bringer, uh, rescuing him from the suffocation. What if he hadn't had him? Would that have all happened? I don't know. I do know this. 
Paul gets all the credit for what he did. And Anas of Force did one small thing faithfully. And the big thing may have never happened. Church, do you understand where this is going? Do you see what Jesus said? Will you be faithful in one small thing and see what God will do with it? It may seem insignificant. It may seem like nothing. But what if you do it to God's grace, God's glory, in God's power, by the Holy Spirit? What, what if you do it like that? One small thing, just stay faithful and see what God will do. We've just begun Christ in the Feet season. You heard uh, Wes open it last week. It's a season for action, and it's why we've chosen this verse to be faithful in one small thing. Be, be faithful. It's, that's action. And grow your faith in large ways. You'll become faithful in large things. That's what Jesus said. So in, in a couple of weeks we're going to be asking you to join our One Small Thing Challenge. You can see this website that we have up here. It says peoplerestored.life. And, and in a couple of weeks, we're going to ask you to go to that. You can go to it now if you want, but in a couple of weeks, we're going to ask you to go to that. And we're going to ask you, we're asking you, everybody here, we're asking you, will you be faithful in one small thing? On there, you will find three ministries that our church supports financially and supports with volunteers and with help. And so, and there are significant um, results through those three uh, ministries. The first one is Choosing Hope. It is a statewide organization that steps in to help y young ladies who find themselves uh, unexpectedly pregnant. And, and um, if they will be willing to move forward and give birth and, and, and uh, have that baby adopted... They work with the, child, with the young lady, they work with the child, they work with the family who's receiving them. And they, they counsel them, they help them through that emotionally. Um, and even if, the, if the young lady decides not to do the adoption, they still are there for them. And I hope you understand how, how critical that is in this time. It's a really, really good organization doing great things. So you can look at that one. You can also look at Impact Bethel. Impact Bethel is an organization that actually was birthed from this church. And this will surprise some of you, maybe not many of you, but there are kids who if they don't get lunch at school, they don't get lunch. And so in the summertime when school is out, they don't have food. And so this organization uh, gathers food, collects food, buys food, and goes to places where kids are during the summer where they have easy access and they give them free lunch. They also connect with teachers in the different school districts and the teachers are quick to recognize what families legitimately have need and Impact Bethel will provide for them a holiday meal and Christmas presents for kids who aren't going to get that. You can look at that one. The other one is uh, Family Youth Initiative. And Family Youth Initiative is similar, in a way, to Choosing Hope. But they um, intervene and help when there's uh, another unexpected pregnancy, usually for very young ladies. And they help them go through the process of becoming a parent. They will help the father in the process of becoming a parent. They give them parenting classes. They help them emotionally. Uh, they are in seven school districts teaching kids about uh, sexuality and pregnancy and what their options are. Uh, they, they are helpful with, in physical ways with high chairs and, and car seats and formula and all that kind of stuff. So you can see these, this is kind of the category of, of ministries that we're trying to help. And so in, on October 24th, you will be able to go there, look at one of those, uh, look at all of those ministries, choose one, and just say, for the next three weeks, I'm going to do one small thing faithfully. I'm going to do one small thing faithfully, and that will help me grow to be faithful in large things. And you can, you, it'll be on there, you can choose. We will have you uh, write letters to staff, people in those ministries, because you can imagine how heartbroken they get sometimes. They need encouragement. You can buy food, uh, diapers, whatever, for, for babies, formula. Um, they're, they're, you'll find something different for each one of those three things. You can volunteer. And so we're asking you on October 24th to go to that website and get involved by being faithful in one small thing. You'll check it each week and, and learn a little bit about the ministry. You'll learn about who these people are. Some of them are sitting beside you. Church, will you be faithful in one small thing? Now I'm going to ask you this. 
before October 24th comes, we have the opportunity in this moment right now to also be faithful in one small thing. Be an advantage bringer. Give some fresh air to people who feel like they're suffocating. Bring cheer. Bring cheer where there's sadness and discouragement and despair. Be an honest force. We're going to sing a song that's kind of uh, a commitment for you to do that as you look at the word. So I'm going to get off. I'm going to ask you guys to stand up and just, just process all that as you see these words and as you sing these words and as you worship your God. So let's stand.